20 verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Okay, now hang on one sec there. Um, uh, what we have here, he is saying in verse number two, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he is basing these Ten Commandments based on his covenant and having redeemed the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. Okay? And we're going to see something as we go down, especially when we get to the fourth commandment, that is going to make this rather confusing. And this is exactly what I'm going to speak on Sunday. And the reason why is because it deals with the seventh day, okay, the, uh, the, uh, the day when God rested. All of this is going to tie in here together. But I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he's basing it basically the beginning of it on the redemption that he just accomplished for him. And then he says, of course, the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Anything can be a God. And we're going to say this again. We're certainly going to get done with the Ten Commandments today. But I mentioned this last week, I think. Maybe it was in class. Maybe it was at the beach. I can't remember where I said it. But the Tenth Commandment is you shall not covet. Okay. And people say, well, that's the Tenth Commandment. And it's okay. But coveting is actually violating the First Commandment. Because when you covet something, you are placing something that somebody else owns ahead of the Lord your God. So, Coveting is not something to be taken mildly. And all of these, if we go through this logically, and, you know, we got to skip around, and I'm going to skip a million points, but uh, when you look at these commandments, they all ultimately reflect on the other commandments in one way or another. And as I said, there's, there's no really lesser commandment. There are greater commandments, but when you look at them from, from the other side, they're not really lesser because they bear on the greater commandments. Now, Jesus said, before we get into this, and um, I, I think it's in Deuteronomy 5, it is. It's before he gives the, uh, actually, it's in Deuteronomy 6, 6, 4. Anyway, I don't have it here. But before he, or right after he gives the uh, Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy, he says what's called the Shema, or here. Shema means to hear, like the, the name Samuel. Shmuel means God hears, okay? So, to hear. Um, and Jesus said that this was actually the greatest commandment. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Had. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. They were questioning him, what is the greatest commandment? He said, this is it. If you do these other things, you are going to fulfill everything we're about to read. Plus, in the Old Testament, or in, I hate to say the Old Testament, in the, the Torah, the, the first five books of the Bible, there are 613 commandments. But these 10 kind of are the, the basis of all the others. If you do these, then you're going to be obeying all the other laws as well. Okay, that's kind of the idea. But you shall have no other gods before me. Now, I have heard this, and I'm not sure if this is correct, so I don't want to say that definitely, but... Uh, uh, and I could probably, I didn't bring the, the Hebrew translation, but um, uh, I think what the idea is, don't take this as, as uh, correct though, but I've heard this said, and it could be, take it with a grain of salt though, that you shall have no other gods in my presence, in my face in other words. And his presence is everywhere. Do you see what I'm saying? He's, he is everywhere, so when he says that, he's making everything all-encompassing on that, okay? So, there you go. You shall have no other gods before me. And then, uh, verse 4? No, we're not finished with oh. verse 4 yet. Or that is in the earth oh, that's me, right. or that is in the water under the earth. Okay, so he's saying don't make a carved image of any likeness of anything. Now, people will, before we go on, people will say, well, God violated his own commandment another chapter or so later when he asked them to make cherubim on the ark. Weave cherubim into the veil. Do this and do that, right? He had made the, uh, the, the, the snake on the pole. And people will use this argument saying, oh, well, God's violating his own commandments and he hasn't even gotten out of the uh, law of Moses. Okay, incorrect. Verse 5, go ahead. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, 
I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay, here we have uh, right there the answer to that. This is still one commandment. You shall not make for yourself to carve image, an idol of anything, okay? And you shall not bow down to it. In other words, the two are separate. And that's why we can make objects. There's not a problem with the making of objects. Now, just so you know, the Catholic Ten Commandments that are in the Catholic Bible, they divide these differently. Their commandments do not read the same as ours. And I wish I had thought this and brought the Bible to read it to you. What they do is they separate, I believe, their... Um, maybe it's not there. It's... Um, I, oh, I wish I had the cat. If you have it there, go to the Douay du Rheims version. D O U A Y F D O U A Y Douay. Anyway, Douay Rhymes, R H E I M S. Or you can go to the American. There's American Bible, I think. They have the Jerusalem Bible. Those are all Catholic versions. Um, if you do find that, we can read that and you'll see that there is a difference in how they've divided this so that they get away with things that Protestants would not tolerate in the Ten Commandments. Um, but regardless, if she finds that, uh, don't, did you find it? Not yet. No, no, okay. Bible over here. Oh, okay. Oh, good. You should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything on the earth. You should not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The word is kana. He says later, where is it that he says this? I'm, um, uh, your God whose name is Jealous. I'm trying to think of where it says it. It's in the, uh, uh, I got it right here. I've got the concordance. It's the only time, I think, outside of him saying, my name is I am, that he actually identifies something being a part of his character. It would be, let me give you the, the particular thing. But he repeats it here. He repeats it elsewhere. I am a jealous God, but in... Uh, uh, he says it, this is my name. Hang on, H-I-J-J-E-A-L-O-U-S. J-E, J-E, <sighs> jealous. The Lord God, God, am a jealous God, the Lord's. Okay, it's Exodus 34, wait, yes, 3414. I'll read that to you. It says here, um, Exodus 3414. It says, <clears throat> 13, but you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. 14, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Once again, he's associating his name of jealousy with idolatry, with graven images, okay? But I believe that other than saying, I am sent you, this is my name which you shall call me, this is the only other time in the Bible that he actually identifies his name in a, as a proper noun, the word jealous. I could be wrong in that, but that, that is what I believe is correct. You shall worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. The other times he says, I'm jealous, I'm jealous, but not that is my name. Okay, um, uh, I am the Lord your God, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, what that means... In, we should probably get this out of the way here, is that in people will preach, and I'm sure you've probably heard it if you've listened to enough sermons, the generational curse. Have you heard sermons on the generational curse? Okay. There's two points about that. The first point is that that is a general statement of, in other words, if you go back and you look at the line of preachers that came over hundreds of years ago in America, Generally, their descendants after them are godly people, and they maintain this in their lineage. Now, this isn't a, a universal. I'm not trying to say that, but you will see that a godly family generally produces godly people. People that have no love of God will generally have children that don't love God. This is the general way of things, okay? Um, uh, and that is something that is just part of the upbringing. So is God actively visiting the uh, the, uh, what is it, the iniquity? How did he say that? Don't want to misquote it. He says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. Is he actively doing that, or is it like hardening Pharaoh's heart, passive in action? And I would say that it's passive in action, that God is saying that if you live out your life this way, you are more than likely going to be blessed because of the way you live. And this is repeated elsewhere. 
it says in the Law of Moses, it says it's repeated in um, one of the kings that was killed and they did not take vengeance out on the people's children because it says, let me not misquote this, but let me get the idea. It says, um, a, a man will not be punished for the sins of his uh, parents. Uh, children will not be punished for the sins of their parents. So if somebody does something wrong, you don't take it out on the family. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that I believe what he is saying here is passive in nature. Visiting the iniquity on the third and fourth generation is just something that's going to carry through because we are not being uh, responsible parents and it's infecting the family as a whole. And the reason why I say that is because if you go to Ezekiel, and I think it's Ezekiel chapter 18, it says here, I'll read it to you, it's a long, it, it, here it is. <laughs> Uh, the word of the Lord came to me again saying, what do you mean when you use the proverb concerning uh, the land of Israel saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. He's equating something happening to the children because of what the fathers do. All right. And what he says is, as I live, says the Lord, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. They're all my creatures, okay? He says, the soul who sins shall die. But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, and he has not eaten on the mountains, meaning eaten in a shrine, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, and he goes through all of these things, keeps going down, going down. He says, if he has an extracted usury, um, uh, keep going. He says, if he has done all these things, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. If he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, and he goes through this whole long thing of what he does, then he says, if he has done all of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Then he says in verse 14, if, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which the father has done and considers but does not do likewise, who hasn't done all these things, he shall surely live. So he's saying if somebody does something and the son does something different, the son is not being treated by the father's guilt or innocence. And he says, if that person turns from his sin, I'm going to treat him differently now that he's repented from his sin. So having said that, near the people had this fatalistic attitude. Well, why should we do good or bad? Because it's all in the Lord's hand anyway. And then they came back and they said, yet you say, O house of Israel, that I am unjust in what I'm proclaiming, right? And he's saying, no, it's you whose ways are unjust. Because if somebody belongs to me and all souls belong to me and they repent of what they're doing, then why should I take out my anger on them? So that's why I don't believe in this particular context that the sermons about generational curses are good, except when they analyze them from the sense of the general family relationships going down to the children, to the, the grandchildren and children after that. General ideas, not that God is actively punishing somebody. And the reason why I say that is especially charismatic churches will say, you need to break that cycle of, of uh, uh, what is it, generation, you got to break that generational curse. And how do you do it? Send us your money. That's showing God. You, I see it all the time. You, they, you know, uh, R Richard Roberts does it with, with healing. He does it with this. He does it. They take all of these things out of context, and it always says, send us your money. This will break this curse. This will enact that healing. I got to tell you, I, I'm just going to stop right now for a second. It made me so mad. I almost brought it up yesterday, and I forgot. I was watching a guy last Sunday after church. Not yesterday, but last Sunday after church. I've been stewing on this guy for over a week. I got to tell somebody. He was, it wasn't on a regular Christian channel either. It was on a, uh, a uh, uh, like channel two or three or, you know, just one of these. And he must have reserved the time. And he's standing up there preaching and he's talking. He was in finances for 30 years and he says, I understand how finances work. And he's just boasting about how good he is at money management. And he, he, then he started his preaching saying that this will release this in your life. This will, you will be wealthy. And he started saying, repeat after me, I deserve more stuff. And these people were, yes, Lord, I deserve more stuff. And he said exactly those words. And then he says, I deserve to be rich. And he's a preacher saying these things. And I, I was so mad when I heard this that anybody, anybody could dare to demand this like that. And I, so I hate to, to divert too far on these things, but I had to say this. I, I had to go out to the uh, Occupy. 
Oh boy, yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, you talk about hypocrites. Yeah. They're out there getting paid and, ooh, did you find it? Yeah, I found something. Um, well, which, which area were we looking at? Uh, the, the adultery one? Well, I, I, I was just going to go through them and see there's a division in there that is different. I can't remember which one, and I didn't want to misquote which one it is. All right, I meant the Ten Commandments, in, Com, Roman Catholicism. That'll probably do. Go ahead and read them real quickly, and then we'll go back to analyzing these, but I want to see if I can find their division. Do they have them numbered as the commandments, or just... I have it listed as um, one column is the actual verses that we're reading right now. Right. And then um, an analysis. And then it has their, what they say. Okay. Well, I don't care what they say. I just wonder how they've divided. Go ahead and read just their Ten Commandments and we'll see where it okay. is. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no strange gods before me. Okay. Verse 24 through 6 has nothing. It's deleted. So we have to see idolatry in the Catholic Church. Oh, well, that would be it right there then, because that is... The next to it says, there is idolatry in the papal system, so the second commandment has been deleted, and sometimes it's been absorbed into the first. All that's that's it right there. Are it, along one they, they've combined one and two together, and the reason why they've done that is because they have... I, I, I don't want to get technical on here, and I'm going to screw this up anyway, but they have two forms of idolatry. Idolatria and idoldulia, okay, Latin terms. I'm going to get whichever one wrong, and I apologize for this, but I believe one of them means actively worshiping an idol. This is how they split hairs to get away with what they do. The other one is to pay service to an idol, like that makes any difference at all, okay? I have, and if you want, I'll print it off for you. I don't think I gave you a copy of this, but maybe I did. I have, I go, I haven't done it in the past five months or so, but I used to go onto the Vatican website every single day, and I would read everything that the Pope said all around the world, wherever he was, he, and I have things that he would say right there, and they record it, it's right on there, you can go to the Vatican website, as a matter of fact, I give the link, you know, and if you want them, email me, and I'll send you the links, and I'll also send you what he said. But one of them was uh, about two years ago, maybe three years ago, he was at the Shrine of the Blessed Virgin, something down in Italy, and he uh, said, if you bow to this idol and you speak to this idol and say, oh, Mother Mary, full of grace, um, uh, only in you is salvation or something, and you repeat it eight times, you're going to get this many indulgences. Did I give you that? I know, but I'll, I'll repeat it for you. Okay. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Right. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now till the end of our death. Amen. Right. So he said to do that, and then he said a couple other things that they were to say to this, this totally taking your eye off Jesus. Totally. T what's that? For indulgences, you mean? For, well, yes. He said, if you do this, you will That's be given like plenary indulgences for. And then he said what they were for. And I can, like I say, I can send you the link. I got it right there. And I have all kinds of stuff like this that he goes out and tells people to do. Worshipping this idol. Worship, actively bowing down to it. But he says, this is idol dulia, not idol latria, or vice versa. Whichever one. I can't remember. Because I, 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 I wasn't really preparing for this and thinking about it this morning. But... That is how they get away with that, is they delete this commandment or they just simply incorporate it into the first commandment. So we say that this is the first, and then later they have to make up for it by uh, uh, breaking up into the last commandment, which is coveting. I believe that's where it's at. Are you down at uh, the 10th commandment? Can you go down to that one? Nine and 10 of the, the Catholic. Yeah, it says that, um Nine is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and yep. ten is thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's goods. There you go. So what they've done is they've taken two and either deleted it or incorporated it as part of one, and then they've taken ten and they've divided it into two separate commandments, which coveting is coveting. It doesn't matter what. But that is how they got away with that. And the reason why it goes back exactly what you said, indulgences. It all, and it used to come down to money. Now they can't admit that, and so you get indulgences for getting people out of purgatory. You get indulgences for, uh, uh, you know, right in the, I've got a Catholic Bible at home, unless I gave it away, because I get Bibles all the time, and I, I have them for a while, and then I pass them on. 
But uh, I, I think I still have this one, this big Catholic Bible, very beautiful. But right at the beginning, you'll get this many indulgences if you read the Bible, which surprised me because a lot of the Catholics I know were told never to read the Bible. This one gives you indulgences, but it, 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 I think it sticks to the Gospels. I may be wrong on that, but I think it says if you read the Gospels 15 minutes a day or something or whatever, and I don't want to misquote that, I may be wrong. But um, uh, so you see the theological differences here. Roman Catholicism takes a different approach to these. And if you go... Oh, yeah, that's right. But if you go to the Hebrew Ten Commandments, they read like the Protestant Ten Commandments. They stick to the way it's presented here, not the way that the Catholics have divided it so that they can get away with idolatry. Because, of course, idolatry is a massive part of the Catholic system. Rosary, for example, is idolatry. I mean, you're, you're focused... The, whole premise of the Bible to me, and I'm not saying this is the most important verse in the Bible, but it's my favorite verse in the Bible simply because it is the premise of the Bible. It's Hebrews 12 too. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And only the first seven words actually, and only the NIV because other versions will say, looking unto Jesus. It doesn't have the same oomph to me. That's why I like the way that the, uh, the uh, NIV writes it. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus in the emphatic, okay? And as long as you're doing that, whether it's looking unto Jesus or whether it's let us fix our eyes on Jesus, it's saying that this is what we are to do with our lives. And if we do this, then everything else will fall into place. Everything in their system is designed against that, starting with these Ten Commandments. And that's not, once again, that's not to hammer on the Catholics because I know saved Catholics. But you can hammer on doctrine all day and that's fair. If you come in here and you know of a doctrine which is unsound in another church, bring it up. But I don't want to attack people because, you know, Mary, she's not here today, but she, for a while there, was very upset because I bring up Methodist doctrine. And she thought I was picking on Methodists. And Jean, it was you that told her. Jean said to her, you've misunderstood what Charlie is doing. He is saying that this is the doctrine of the church. I was a Methodist for a year and a half or so. I got lots of friends that are Methodists, right? Good people in there, but they don't know the church doctrine. And the more that you understand the church doctrine, the more likely you are to move away from these older reformed churches because their doctrine changes. And that's, that's what happens. You start getting catechisms. You start getting books of order. And people use that in place of the Bible. As long as you stick to the Bible. And one thing, I think I mentioned it in this class, so I want to get this out of the way right now. Apparently, the statement of faith, I mentioned that I didn't like the statement of faith that they had proposed. It's the same statement of faith in the Constitution. The statement of faith on the website is different than the statement of faith in the Constitution. And so, I have no problem with the statement of faith as they proposed it because there are reasons why they took the original statement of faith at Grace Baptist, and that was because of legal protections. But their statement of faith, their general statement of faith that's on the website is the one that I like as a doctrinal statement, not a constitutional statement. There is a difference. And so I, I didn't understand that when I said that because all I had was the statement of faith from the website, which, boy, is it beautiful. Whoever did our website statement of faith, right on target, points of doctrine. But the other ones, you know, they mentioned bestiality. They mentioned uh, 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 homosexuality. That is for legal reasons, they have those in the church constitution. And I talked to Kevin uh, Campbell about that, and he says, oh yeah, we had a lawyer review this, and that's why we don't want to delete those, is because if a homosexual comes into the church and that's not in there, he can start demanding rights that the church can't deny any longer. So this is important, and I had no idea about that, that there were two yeah, statement of faiths. Yeah, I'm glad you that I, boy, I, me too, because, you know, I don't want to say anything in here to influence somebody. Well, we don't like the, 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 the Grace Baptist Constitution because of when, in fact, their general statement of faith is it's the guidelines for the church. That's what people are going to read if they go to the website and they say, we want to maybe attend this church. That is what they're going to read, the one that I read in the class at one time. Oh, boy, very well done, and it's simple. But legally, we need to have other protections. And so, good point there. Anyway, so um, now you understand the difference between what the Catholics have done in verses um, 3 and 4. Those, those two, go ahead. Uh, what we were talking about the Hail Mary is what caused me when I was 9 years old to get a whipping. I told you about that because I asked the, the nun a question. Right. She got the priest. Priest said I was challenging the Bible. Oh no! 
Mm. I got a spanking from him. I got a spanking from my dad for questioning the nut. Oh my goodness. But, you know, eight, eight, nine years old, you know. Yeah. I didn't understand we wasn't into the Trinity yet. Right. And I put my hand up and I said, I don't understand if Mary's the mother of God, who's the mother of Jesus? Yeah. Oh, that was the wrong thing to say. Oh, boy. And that, that's a doctrine that goes way back. I mean, that's not anything new. Some people like to say that's a Catholic. You know, Mother Mary of God, I think they call it the Theotokos, and I could be wrong on that. But that goes back, like, to the three or 400 ADs. It is a divergent, you know, from biblical Christianity, but it's a very old one. Um, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who I quote a lot on the nature of God, apparently believed in Mary, the mother of God. So, I mean, this is something that gets into people's head and they don't want to, all of a sudden, once something is introduced into a church, you think, well, I don't want to be counter to that. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, if somebody came in here and for the next 15 years, say Pastor Steve started teaching one doctrine, it was just odd, okay? Well, no, I know, I'm just saying, I, and I know he won't, but if he did and people heard it week after week, they would start to think, well, that must be right. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that he would ever do that. That's, I, but in, especially in a church like this, because so many people know their Bible, that wouldn't happen. But if he went into a church where people didn't know their Bible, and you know, they just started teaching something that was aberrant, like Mary, the mother of God, then you would have this problem. But what you just said, and I may have mentioned this in this class before, it's interesting, like though. A slight parallel there. Well, go ahead. You said Obama attending Jeremiah Wright's church for 20, 20 years, years and not knowing yeah. that that was his doctrine. No, not, not possible. 20 years. Not possible. He married his, he and his wife. Yeah. Yeah. Baptized their kids. But somehow I just didn't know. I didn't know that he believed that. No, come on. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, that's right. Maybe he was just too busy voting press. Or he's lying. That's right. Well, we have... Um, uh, one other thing on this particular issue, and like I said, I may have brought this up in this class before, but when I interviewed the Jewish couple for my college, I had to uh, interview people of a different faith, and I wanted to do a Jewish rabbi. None of the rabbis would speak to me. So he had this old Holocaust survivor who, you know, they're not going to change their values. This is instilled in them. They went through the Holocaust, and so he knew they were a safe bet. He had me talk to this man. And when I brought up the Trinity, he said, I, oh, I didn't even bring up the Trinity in any general sense. I asked him because I told him before I went in there, I will not give you any Christian doctrine. I'm here to interview you and I'm not here to evangelize you. Okay? So he allowed his wife to sit in there as well. I said, this is what I am required to do with my college. And if you will do this, I will make a commitment to not evangelize you. But when I got done, we were all finished. I said, sir, I'm finished. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the tape now. I think I left it running for this though. But I, I said, I'm all done. And I said, now that I've finished, I would like to know if you have any questions about Christianity, right? And uh, he had two. One was on denominations. Why are there so many denominations? And I gave him my answer there. And the second was, can you explain this Trinity to me? And I said, sure, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I started explaining. He said, what, 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 what? I, he said, what do you mean, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I said, that's the Trinity that Christians believe. And he said, no, it's Father, Mary, and Holy Spirit. Father, Mary, and Jesus. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not even, that's not even Catholic doctrine. No. He said, what? He, that is what the rabbis teach them because it's so obviously wrong that it, 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 no Jewish person would ever accept that. And so that's what they teach them so they never question it. And when he heard it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I could have gone on all day. I could have told him about the Spirit and verse 2 of chapter 1 and gone all the way through the Bible, but I left, you know, I didn't want to dishonor my commitment that I made in advance. So the questions he had, we came up with those two particular questions and he allowed me to explain a little bit. But uh, uh, anyway, that, things like that, because Mary is the mother of God in the Catholic religion, people can use that. And I'm not saying it's Catholic, but people can use that and say, well, that's what Catholics believe. Well, the Catholics to the Jewish people are the church. There's no, you know, what's a reform? They, they don't get that deep. They know there's differences. But to them, the Catholics are Christianity. Well, there's and so, 99%, of, it seems like to 90% of the world that's the case. That's right. The church and the Catholic church are synonymous. Synonymous. And, you know, one thing you brought that up is that in Hollywood, if they want an authority figure for a show or a movie, 
It's always a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. He wears the black thing with the collar. That is the most recognized position of authority, or it was, I don't know, about the past four or five years. But for years and years, that was the figure of authority. All so, the way back to Bing Crosby and William Bendix. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's just kind of interesting how people do tie the two together. But you can see right here in the first and Second Commandments, how much difference there is theologically between the two. Getting back to Mary, uh, you know, we had a discussion two weeks ago, I think it was. And after we left here, uh, we, we went home and she followed us home. And she said, Jim, I want you to go over that one more time with me. And so I went over with her and I said, Mary, <coughs> 49 years at St. John's, I said, it's hard to give up, isn't it? Yeah. I said, Charlie was right. When you said, if the Catholics know this is wrong, why are you, why do they still go to the church? And Charlie came back and said, why do you still want to go back to the Methodist church? I said, Charlie was right. I said, but Mary, you got, this is the way I take it. She said, don't you get offended when he talks about Catholics? I said, if it's not something that I agree with that I experienced going to the Catholic You bring school, it up. I'll bring it up. Yep. I said, but I'm taking it as a learning stage, and you should too. Yeah. You need to know more about your religion than what you're learning at your St. John's. Oh, yeah. And That's I right. Said, uh, we didn't find out about the abortion. Until you all got together. Until... Cal Thomas brought it up on right. his commentary. Right. And then that started the ball rolling. Yeah. I said, but don't take a festival with Charlie saying, take it as an education. Yeah. And, you know, she's got to understand that she may not even know that I was in the Methodist church for, like, say, a couple of years. So and anyway, she said, how do you know that that first bishop was conservative? I said, Mary, Diane was conversing with him when he, she was writing the letter to the pastor to give us answers to these. Right. And she sent him an email in Tallahassee and said he's been fighting it since 1973. Unbelievable. That's a man of determination. Yeah. You know, and my hat's off to him because I have read several people that were just really barbecued for remaining in the Methodist church, bishops and, and uh, I guess you call them priests. She very deep denial. Oh, I know. And she brought that up right in the class. She said, well, this new man is going to change things. And I thought and one man isn't going to change well, anything. Neither was the Lord. And so I told her, I said, do you think, I'm kind of anxious to talk to her because the new bishop was over there. In Tampa. Night. Oh, at the church? Yeah. Oh. And he wanted all the Methodists in the area to come. Huh. And... And she said, I'm going to see what he's going to do. I said, Mary, he's not going to do nothing. Yeah. He can't buck against said, the votes. Do you realize that the bishops don't even go to Washington to vote? The Florida Conference right. picks somebody Delegate. to go. Right. And I said, so the same 32 people is still up there that was voted in in 19... 90-something. Right. Unless one dies, it's the same people doing the same thing. So the Supreme That's Court. Pastor yeah. Bill told us that. You know, it, it's a shame for her. I feel for her. I do, too, because I know she's torn over this, yeah. you know. And she I, told me, though, she said, I make you my promise. They got the, the vote coming up this year. I said, yes, Mary, I know. She said, if they don't do anything about it, she said, I'll tell him to take my membership away. Good. Well, you know, and she's struggling with this, but you know what? She is putting the Lord first, and that's what shows a real noble character. It really does. It just, you know, my hat's off to her, especially with being in a, a place that, it's like people, you know, that are in grace, and they're here their whole life. If this church started to deviate, the ones that got up and walked out would have, you know, just think of the rewards the Lord would bless them with. You know, now there would be other people with the same heart that would stay here and would be praying every day for the church. Everybody's different. Some people can handle it this way. And that's why I say the priests or whatever you call them, and I think they call them priests in the Methodist church, that do stay, that want change. They're not priests in the Methodist church. Reverence. Okay, that's right. But the ones that stay, 
that are conservative, my hat's off to those people because they really want to keep things from falling further apart. And if they leave, it's just going to fall to pieces. Well, so, I talked to mine. He was conservative. Yeah. No, he said he's conservative. And he said, Gene, if I walked away from this now, I wouldn't get a retirement. Well, that, you know. You know and, that, and that. That I would have to disagree with. Yeah. yeah. No. That's exactly what I told you. Or if you, yeah, you heard yesterday. I listened to that Lutheran preacher before I came to church yesterday. And that guy said, how many of us here, speaking to this conference of, of Lutheran preachers, put our paycheck ahead of our, and I'm misquoting what he said, but basically you're putting your paycheck above your doctrine. You know, abortion is wrong. He, he made the most, I mean, my hair was standing up at the homosexual issue and the abortion issue. And I got to tell you, I needed that because that's what I spoke on last night at the beach. And I needed to have that. It just came at the right time. And, uh, uh, you know, because you don't know how far should I take this, but everything he said was exactly with what I agreed with, and so it just solidified me. I need to make sure that I make this stand as well. And, you know, you never know until you come up. It was all typed. It was all ready for the past three weeks, but is that what I'm going to do? Film, you know, about oh, unreal. If people really stopped and took that thing literal, during the Second World War, the Nazis murdered six million Jews. Yep. Our country has now 50, 55 million babies. Babies. Created in God's image. 55 million. That's, yeah, the 6 million Jews, very sad, but it's, what's that, Six, almost 1 to 10 on the number of abortions. And just you since... Could have the on. What? You, 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 could have, you could throw in the people with... Oh, sure. ...killed and it wouldn't come up. Sure. Okay. Not even close. I That's right. I to a radio program. Um, I don't remember what station it was on. And I'm not quite sure. I came into the middle of it, so I don't know who was speaking or what it was about. But the statement I heard from it made me laugh because he's sitting there and he's talking about abortion and about whether to make it legalized for everyone to oh. have it or to make it where it's free for anyone who needs it and right. all this stuff. He's like, a, he said, in the past people said rich people could get abortion wherever it was. And he said, I just thought to stop and think about what they were saying. Rich people could get it anywhere. So why are you trying to legalize and legitimize a rich person's sin for the whole entire population? Right. Why not? Exactly. Why are you making a sin more easily available? That's right. For the exact same logic as what I bring up every time I talk on the issue. They, what are the two exceptions they always bring up? Always for abortion. Health of the Race mother. The and health of the mother. Well, health of the mother would be the third one. The two that NARAL brings up are rape and incest. That's right, those two. Now, the question is, does killing a child cover the sin that, that happened? No. no, it doesn't do anything. And that's exactly the same logic, and I'd never thought of that before. But all you're doing is you're increasing the number of sins by killing that child. That's exactly. all you're doing. That's, you're not, so what, she got raped. involved in the sin of having an abortion. Right. Doctors, nurses, Every one of them is complicit in that. That's right. And you know what? It's not that the rape of a woman is, is, is good by any stretch of the imagination. But killing a pregnancy as a result of a rape doesn't fix all makes the other rapes. Makes no do. sense at all. So guys, the statistics of actually pregnant women from a rape is almost non-existent. That's right. And you know, that's one thing that they would never admit. But they make it sound like it happens every 30 seconds in America. And these things just don't come about. And even if they do... It is irrelevant. It is completely irrelevant to the, the baby that's alive in a room. Completely. It's still, no matter how you dress it up, it's still murdered for convenience. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, you know yeah. a rape in a pregnancy, it would be a shame, but the child isn't at fault. Right. It didn't do anything. So, so what, what does that leave you? Well, the convenience of the mother not wanting to raise a kid by herself. So exactly. You know, you know, but somebody would adopt it. But, but you know, but that goes to what we're talking about right here. Talk around it to get to what's inside. You know? That's right. Except you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, though. That goes to exactly what we're talking about there as far as the abortion issue. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. The same people that are having abortions one generation ago in the 60s, their children that did make it are the ones that are having the same abortions, the same groups of people. You know, I'm going to have abortions until I want to have a child, 
and then that child has one, and you know, I know people that have their children, oh yeah, my daughter had an abortion. Are you insane? Whatever. Anyway, so visiting the iniquity of the father to the children, showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, having said that, and we're right at the next commandment now, but before we get there, what is it that Paul quotes in the New Testament, and he quotes Moses, and he says, if you do these things, you will, you will live by these things. And Paul makes the, the example, I think it's in the book of Galatians, where he says that nobody... Nobody can do these things. We're reading these as if they're, you know, uh, absolute guidelines and that, in fact, you know, this is what God expects and that everybody in Israel was suddenly able to do it because God said, you're going to do these things. When Paul says, none of us can do these things. And then what does the Bible do from Exodus chapter 20 all the way through the Old Testament? It gives us examples of people that failed this and how that failure was related to God. Okay, the people that failed and did it high-handedly, in other words, I have no shame, I didn't do any wrong, those are the people that God condemns. Go to the 51st Psalm and see the difference in King David when he committed murder and he committed adultery. And he's, God, take away my sin, my sin is always before me. And of course nobody can do these things because if anybody in this room says, I haven't done these things, and remember that intent Intent is guilt. It doesn't have to be that you've actually killed a person. If you've hated your brother in your heart, can anybody here honestly say they haven't hated somebody at some point in their life where they thought, I just want to, you know, and maybe you haven't, but I have, and it's always on my mind. Oh, I, I can't believe the way that I felt about this person, you know, but even if you haven't done that one, certainly as a woman, you've looked at a man and thought something you shouldn't have, or as a man looked at a woman and thought you shouldn't have. You've coveted something. We have all broken almost all, if not every one of these, okay? If you do these things, you will live by them. And so that is why this is here, is to be the mirror on the depravity of our own souls. That's why we have these things in... Paul calls, doesn't Paul call the law a tutor? Yeah, the law is a tutor to lead us to Christ. I can't do this. I, 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 I'm helpless. Oh, my hair's standing up. Thank you. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's a tutor to tell us there's no way we can do these things. It, it is simply not possible for us to meet these standards. I'm not trying to diminish them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to, to go violating them. But it isn't possible. For, oh, my hair's standing up all over because I see my own depravity. I'll tell you what happened on the way, what was it, three weeks ago or two weeks ago when I almost got run off the road. Somebody had an, yeah, it was wet. A guy spun out right in front of me and I missed him. If I hadn't been looking in my rear view mirror to see if I could get into the next lane, we would have had an accident and I wouldn't have been here. What happens this morning? Somebody goes right across Clark Road, never looked. She's got a cigarette in her hand. I missed her. By I thought, boy, I got to stop coming to Bible class. I'm going to die on the way here. I mean, I don't know. She was older. I don't think she would have been a texter, but she certainly wasn't paying attention. She may have been on a cell phone or something, but I got to tell you what. I had a real thought in my heart there for a second because there was just no consideration of anybody around her. None. It was all just me. I, I need to get over here and, oh, I calmed down after about eight or ten miles, but I got to tell you what, I was really, really upset. You know, what happens, you slam on your brake, this happened once before, slam on your brake, my back hurts already, and I throw it out when I do that. And I, oh, and I got coffee all over the place, because, and I'm just thinking, all because she just needs to get over without Anybody else? Anyway, we can't meet these standards. Can yes, she does. Can I tell you a story about what you're talking about? Yeah. So it happened about six, seven years ago. We were in Pennsylvania, and we had our motor home then, and we were going to go visit my brother, so we'd get out on the road, you know, and speed limit was 35, Diane doing 35, and there was a guy back here just blowing his I horn, giving that. her the finger and all this. <laughs> and... So he got mad and he went around, Zipped around. Her in the other lane and uh, we got up to the red light and the red light was uh, red and he just busted a die she put the window down and she said, you have a nice day, sir, and the Lord bless you. It made him so mad he took off <laughs> the red light and had a placement was on the court. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I said, boy, that was in instantaneous glory. Yeah, that's right. Instant <laughs> yeah, justice. Yeah, that, that was 
Classic. Too funny. Yeah, something similar happened to my grandmother. I was with grandma and grandpa going down the mountain up in Massachusetts, and a guy came zipping around him. Take care, Dave. Zipping around, passed us up, just rushing down in a 30 mile an hour zone, probably going 60. And she said, People like that always get what they're due. She says, It'll come right back to them. And I thought, hey, Grandma, you don't know what you're talking about. This guy's got a cool car. And he's, we got down to the bottom of the mountain. And he was off to the side of the road, and one of his wheels had spun right off his car, and was he was going and getting. I thought, Grandma's right. Better listen to her. Just so funny. Oh, anyway. Okay. Um, verse seven. Verse seven. Okay. You shall not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God, in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay. I have heard so many different commentaries on this particular verse. that I, I honestly don't know which is correct. I've heard that that is not talking about GD at all. Okay, I've heard that one. You know, people say, ah, oh, GD or JC, and that's taking the Lord's name in vain. And then somebody else will say, no, that's not the context of what's being here. What that is saying is that when we make a vow in the Lord's name and we don't perform it, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. And so there are many, many different, this is just two of, I, I can't tell you how many different analysis. Everybody has to be a specialist on this one to the point where I have no idea. One of these days, I need to go to a, 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 a rabbi that studies just the Ten Commandments, and he knows the intent and meaning of these particular Hebrew words. Because I, it, whatever it is, we need to be careful, I believe, not to you know, use the Lord's name inappropriately. Not to swear by the Lord's name and then not to fulfill it. Or, you know, people say, oh, I swear to God. Yeah. I, I, even saying that to me would be taking the Lord's name in vain, even if it's true. Why? Because Jesus said, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. In other words, why invoke the Lord's name on something that ought to be just a matter of honor out of your mouth? And then that's quoted again by Paul and it's quoted again by James. They all say the same thing. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. However, when it says, do not swear in the name of the Lord, the law itself tells us to swear in the name of the Lord. When you make an oath, you are to swear, make your oaths in the name of the Lord. Okay? So you're not to swear a general oath like, I swear I'll be there tomorrow. I swear to God I'll be there. You're not to do that. But when you make an oath or when you go to a, a what do you call it, a, um, uh, a court and you swear an oath, you are swearing it in the name of the Lord. Okay? So we want to make that distinction. The law itself tells us to make perform our vows in the name of the Lord, but we shouldn't be making these careless vows. Our yes should be yes, our no should be no, and we shouldn't go any further than that. And I don't believe, regardless of the context, I don't believe we should ever be saying JC or GD. And if we do, you know, we need to confess it. Lord, I'm sorry. I've, I've said something I shouldn't have said. Okay, and I, I did that one day. I was giving an instruction in this class on a Sunday morning, and I was giving it as an example. I said GD, but I said it out loud. And even that I felt bad about. Even giving it as an example. It, I just went home and I thought, I can't believe that I even let those words out of my mouth because his name is to be treated holy. That's all there is to it. We're not to say things about the Lord. You know, and there are times where maybe we get our foot run over and we say something we didn't mean. We need to confess it as sin. We need to move on because we need to treat the Lord as holy. And, uh, and what is... Peter repeats that in the uh, New Testament. Uh, be holy because I am holy. Uh, uh, be ye holy uh, uh, because I am holy, therefore you be holy, or vice versa. I can't remember which way it says. But anyway, we are to treat the Lord as holy and we are to emulate him in our own lives. So don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Whichever is the correct context, I think we can fold all of those into there. I all of that. That's a bad habit of saying, Lord have mercy. Oh, yeah. When something bothers me, I said, oh, Lord have mercy. Yeah. Diana said, stop that. Stop that. Well, you know, I, if, you know I, I, I wouldn't go too far with that. If you were using in a biblical context, like King David, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Okay. If you are really asking for it, if you're just generally saying it, then, you know, people may perceive it as wrong. It just depends on your context. But, uh, uh, when I get upset. Oh, yeah. I, I did. I did. You know, and, it, it, there, and, you know, I got to tell you, if you're upset and you say that, I would personally have no problem with it because that's exactly what the Psalms ask us to do is to repeat to the Lord his own words. And he's, how many times does Dave say that? K 
King David say that? He says, you know, I called him Dave. <laughs> anyway, verse 8. Okay. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Okay, hold on right there, and I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 5 while you're reading that, okay? I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I remember what I wanted to do. Now, go ahead, and I want you to start reading that again. Let me find it. Okay, I'm going to read at the exact same time as you okay. while you're reading. So you start reading um, verse 8, okay. and I'm going to read verse uh, 12 of Deuteronomy 5, okay? okay Observe the Sabbath day. Go ahead. The Sabbath day to, to keep it holy. Six As the Lord your God commanded you, six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor the cattle, or your, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well. Okay? Now, go ahead and read the next one. For in and remember days, that you were a slave. Go ahead. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Okay, so there's a difference. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Keep reading. Oh, let's see, where did I leave off? For, For in days, six days. Then the, uh, made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Okay, and this one says you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought you out. Uh, from there with a the mighty hand. So Genesis or the Exodus account is basing it on creation. He's already based it on redemption in verse number one, but in the Sabbath command, he is basing it on creation. In Deuteronomy, he's basing it on redemption again. Do you see the difference? That makes a huge difference as to whether we have to observe a six days, uh, a seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, like the Seventh Day Adventists believe, or whether we can have a day of worship. Okay, we'll talk about that later. We're not going to do it now. As a matter of fact, that's my sermon next Sunday is going to be on that particular issue. Why is there a difference, and how does that point to the fact that we do not have to observe a seventh day Sabbath like the Seventh Day Adventists do, and why does that actually lead? to us being separated from Christ. And I will give you that point right now, just so you know. Paul says in the book of Galatians, I'm going to go there, you don't need to turn there, but I'll read this to you. Use the same logic, though, for um, uh, the Sabbath as you do for circumcision when I read this. Hang on, it, Galatians, right here. It says here, um, I think it's chapter 5. Hang on one second here. Uh, it might be chapter 6. Hang on one second here. Let him who is taught. And we've brought this up before, but this bears on what we're talking about right now. Where is it? Um, uh, see what large letters. Maybe it's chapter 4. Where is it? Um, why can't I remember these things? Doggone it. It should be right in front of me. Uh, circumcised Christ. Oh, yeah. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. This is chapter 5. By which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul say to you that if you become circumcised, what the Jewish people were doing is they were going up and they were saying, well, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. They're saying this to the Gentiles. He says, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And then he says in verse 3, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Okay? What he is saying here is that if you, as, hi, Diane, if you get yourself circumcised in order to fulfill the law of Moses, then you are a debtor to the entire law of Moses. That's all there is to it. And he's saying that use the same logic now with the seventh day Sabbath. If you observe the seventh day Sabbath, you are under the whole law of Moses because the Sabbath is fulfilled. Now, I'm not going to explain that right now because we'd spend all day talking about why is the Sabbath fulfilled. And we can do that anytime you want. But I just want you to understand that if you are doing something under the law in order to obtain Christ's favor, then you are negating the very grace that God bestowed on you in Christ Jesus. Okay, now that's not to say that if you are circumcised that you're, you have to observe the law. 
if your mother and your father circumcise you because they believe that it's healthy to circumcise a child the way that God ordained 6,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, actually farther because it was Abraham, so we'll say about 4,500 years ago. If, you, uh, if your parents do that, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about if you feel compelled to be circumcised because somebody says you have to do this or you can't be saved, then you're a debtor to the entire law. And the same logic applies to the seventh-day Sabbath. Like I said, we, we won't go into it because we would spend all day talking about this. I mean, it, it's, it's a big study, but Hebrews 4 is what will direct you to this. Why do we worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? And Paul goes so far as to say elsewhere, one man esteems one day above, above another. Some men don't esteem any day. He says, let everybody be, feel right in his own mind, be convinced in his own mind. In other words, when we do something, it should be done out of faith. If we are observing Sunday worship, we should do it out of faith. If you go to the Seventh-day Adventist church and you have a Saturday Sabbath, it needs to be a faith. It is because, if it is because they told you that if you don't do this, you can't be saved, which is exactly what they'll teach you, then you are not doing it out of faith and you are a debtor to the whole law. And then what do the Seventh-day Sabbath people do? Not all of them. There are different denominations or sects within the Seventh-day uh, Seventh Adventist, but some of them say no pork, right? Well, that's part of the law. And they say no, um, what is another one? But then they ignore the fact that it says in the same law that you have to go to Jerusalem every year for all of the festivals. They ignore the part of the law that says sacrifice. Well, they say that was fulfilled in Christ. Well, guess what? It's all fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews says it three times. The law is set aside in Christ twice. It says one time the law is obsolete. Either it's obsolete or it's not. So what do they do? They use the term, this is God's unchanging commandment. They say God's unchangeable commandment. The seventh day Sabbath is God's unchangeable commandment. The Ten Commandments, okay? What is the problem with it being called an unchangeable commandment? When did God ordain the seventh day? On the seventh day, right? Did he ordain it on the first day of creation? Did he ordain it on the second day of creation? Okay, so this is not a part of his nature. This is a part of what he created. The seventh day is a part of creation because before he created, there was no time. There was no matter or there was no space or any of these things. So the seventh day Sabbath is a part of creation. Okay, Jesus said, uh, how did he say it? I don't want to get it wrong because I always have to think this through. Therefore, um, uh, the Sabbath was created for man. Man was not created for the Sabbath, okay? In other words, the Sabbath is a creation. Therefore, it cannot be one of his unchangeable laws. Something that is contrary to his very nature is an unchangeable law. You shall not kill is contrary to his nature. Why? Because man is created in God's image. If man is created in God's image and you take God's image bearer and you kill it, that is contrary to his nature. Do you see the difference? As long as you guys understand that. If not, we can talk about it all day. But the Sabbath was set aside for two reasons. One for creation, Exodus. The second in the Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, the Deuteronomy account, it's based on redemption. Creation, what does it say we are in Christ? We are, behold, we are new creatures or new creation, okay. depending new on the trans. Creation. Right, okay. And then what does it say in uh, the redemption? He's our redeemer. He is the end of the law. The law is set aside. And so Hebrews 4.3 is the final text verse on the Sabbath and then we'll be done. Now we who believe have entered that rest. We have entered the rest of God. And that goes back, we'll talk about it again when we get to the book of Hebrews and also the uh, 100 and the, the 37th Psalm, the one where it says today, if you harden your hearts, uh, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in rebellion. That points to the fulfillment of the seventh day coming in at the time of Jesus. Anyway, just so you know that that is why we are not sitting in a church on Saturday and, you know, other crazy things like not eating pork or whatever. If you don't want to eat pork, don't eat pork. But that is not something that you are obliged to under the law. Okay. If you, you know, uh, well, that was even made clear to Peter. Oh, yes, it was. I, I, absolutely. It was made abundantly <laughs> clear. Yeah, abundantly clear. He's but like even then, people, people will ex exchange what that says for something else. Here's how they get around that. Seeing as how you brought that passage up, 
Um, you know the passage uh, she just mentioned where the sheet comes down full of all of the animals and it says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Do you all know that one? Do you know that one? No, okay, we're going to go there then. Might as well get that done because this all ties in. It all ties in together. Um, it's in Acts chapter 8 maybe or hang on, where was that? Um, maybe a little later. Um, and see, I don't have a red letter Bible, so, uh, it, it, oh, yes, I do. Saul, why are you persecuting me? It must be a little leader. Oh, here it is. It's verse, uh, chapter 11. It says, and I'll just read it real quickly. Now the apostles and brethren were in Judea. Oh, no, that's, oh, here it is. It's chapter 10. He's recounting it in chapter 11. It says, um, there was a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man. Italian Regiment. He's a Gentile. Okay, He's a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Okay, But he's a Gentile. About the ninth hour of the day, he cl saw clearly in a vision an angel coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up before uh, up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, Peter the Apostle. Okay, he is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the household to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry. Okay, this is something that it, 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 they're tying in his hunger. Okay, so you can't mistake what he became very hungry and wanted to eat. Now, why is that included in here? It's included in here for a specific reason, because it deals with food. In other words, it didn't have to say he became hungry. He could, they could have just skipped that first, but that has a bearing on what we're talking about. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and objects like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. These are all unclean animals that Jewish people were not allowed to eat. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. He's saying it's cleansed. Whatever is in the sheet is cleansed. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. Okay. Then it says, now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision he had seen meant, behold, men who had been sent from Cornelius, so it starts out with Cornelius, goes to Peter, now it's going back to the people that were sent from Cornelius, okay? And uh, it goes down, oh, let me go ahead and just read it. Uh, uh, they stood before the gate and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, this Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down uh, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent with him from Cornelius, and he said, Yes, I am he who you seek. Why have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Okay, and the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Then it goes on from there. It talks about it. Okay. Now, first thing, before I explain this, that goes back to Ezekiel 4. Ezekiel 4 was told exactly the same thing. Here is something that you are going to do. Eat defiled food in certain thing. Okay. And Ezekiel says, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything pure or unclean unclean or defiled in my life. Same thing Peter said. And then God makes an accommodation for him. He says, okay, I'm going to allow you to exchange this for this. He was told to, uh, to uh, cook his food over human waste. And he said, no, Lord. And he said, okay, I'm going to allow you to use cow dung, which was considered clean. The Lord made an accommodation for Ezekiel. 
He made no accommodation for Peter. And not only that, he said it three times. You are going to follow this. Now, there are such as the Seventh-day Adventists, and even my neighbors who attended a Methodist church wouldn't eat pork, and here's why. They said, that is not speaking about food. That is speaking about clean Gentiles. Do you see? Because it started with Cornelius, and it ended up with Cornelius, and it's saying that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. So it's not speaking about food at all. And I admit, that is one of the two applications that we are to take away from that. There is no distinction between the Jew and Gentile. But the second application, which is as clear as crystal, is that he was hungry and he wanted food and God said this food is clean. Okay, The very fact that that is mentioned and it's sanctifying all things as clean means that they are allowed to eat this food. Okay. When Peter, they would have in the Gentiles house, right? That's exactly the point I was going to make. When he went to Cornelius' house, what did they have in their tummies? They had food that was unclean, and they also would have served it when Peter showed up. Mm -hmm. And they are clean, and Peter never says, you got to get rid of all this stuff before I come into your house. He walked into his house, and he fellowshiped with them. Point taken. It has two applications. One, that people are clean because of Jesus, and two, food is clean because of Jesus. Why? Because we're back in the law now. He fulfilled the law. That law was set aside only for the Jewish people. All the other people of the entire world, up until the time of Moses, everybody had Saturday morning bacon feasts and they had it Tuesday afternoon possum cook-offs, right? Then God made a separate distinct group of people to show how impossible it was to meet God's laws. And then he sent his son to fulfill that law on our behalf. All things are clean again because of the work of Jesus Christ. So if you ever get that, I, the reason why I went into all that detail is because you will be approached with that someday. Why are you eating pork? I had somebody actually last Saturday post on one of my YouTube videos. They said, why are you, it was a Seventh-day Adventist, why are you teaching people to break God's commandments? And I explained exactly like I, I've been explaining here. Why, here's what I said, my first line to them was, why are you setting aside the grace of Christ? But even Christ said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all that's your right. mind, and all your strength, and you love, love others as yourself, and that fulfills the full law of the... That's the, right. Fulfills everything, the law of the prophets. That's the right. Absolutely. Love. And how do you do that? By Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But that was my question to her, and then I explained why, but I said, why are you setting aside the grace of Christ? which is exactly what you're doing if you are sitting in a Seventh-day Adventist church and trying to fulfill the law, which is already fulfilled. Right back to Galatians 5, 1 through 3. If you do this, you are a debtor to the whole law. You have a choice now. It's either Jesus Christ or it's the law, and you can't mix the two. The two, it's like oil and water. They don't mix. So, very well said. Um, okay, wherever we were, Gene, you're on. I'm just going to finish up. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, that, the seventh day. And rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, it is holy. It is holy. All of the Ten Commandments are holy. But I just explained why we don't have to observe a seventh day is because we are holy because of Christ. We are holy because of Christ. So we are living in our Sabbath rest. Right now, we are living, and let me go back. I explained this when we were at that passage, but we'll do it real quickly, just so you can see. One more point. First day of creation, it says uh, God created on the first day, and then what does it say at the very end of the first day? What does it say? And Evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day, right? Four, five, six. Okay, three, four. Okay, each day it says the same thing. Ditto, 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 ditto. Seventh day, what does it say? What's that? It says he rested. Does it say evening and morning were the seventh day? No. Why? Because this is God's rest. It's eternal. There's no more creation. All of this is creation. There is no evening and morning on the seventh day. The seventh day is what it is. Okay? Do you see the logic here? Because there's no evening and morning, that means that this must still be going on. There's no end to it. And that's exactly what he is saying in Genesis and then what 
uh, the account of the people going into the promised land, not believing. And the psalm says, today if you harden your hearts, do not, uh, 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 today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. Well, what they're saying is, here is creation, this day right here. And then here's King David writing, I think it's the 33rd Psalm. I may be wrong. It's one of the 30-something Psalms, 37 maybe. We'll say 37. Today, and the Bible's always capitalized the T, because they understand that this is a very important doctrinal issue. Today, if you harden his hearts, do not... Well, what, that, what, what is that saying? It's saying that if this here is today, and it's referring back to here, then this day must still be going on right here. And then Hebrews says it again. He says, I think, four times in the book, uh, chapter 4 of Hebrews, maybe three times, capital T, today, if you hear his voice, and he's referring back to David right here. It's all the same day. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. All of this is referring back to the seventh day of creation. And what does it say? As I said, Hebrews 4, 3. Now that we who believe do enter that rest. That's it. We're in the seventh day of the Sabbath. So this whole thing, and this is important, and I know it's confusing, but it's important to try to remember Hebrews 4.3 if you're talking to an Adventist. And then have them contemplate the things that we're talking on. Because if you understand what God is doing and that the Sabbath is a part of creation, it says, therefore God ordained it and called it holy. What are we doing right now? As believers in Jesus Christ, we are set apart, we are sanctified, we are holy, we are living in God's rest right now. And that's why Paul says every day is the same. If you want to have one day above another, go ahead. If you want to have every day the same, go ahead. Let everybody be in their own mind convinced. What is convinced? Grace. Understand. But faith based on his. That's right. That is what he is saying. And because positionally, we're not down here. That's, we are seated in the heavenly realms. Good point. I didn't even think of that. I, oh, got my hair up on that because I can use that in the future. We are sitting in the heavenly realms with Christ, Ephesians 2, 7. And if we are, then we're in God's rest. That's exact positionally we are already there. And I know that that is complicated and it takes a lot of verses to get to it. But this is the only way to defend against them because they are, this is God's unchangeable law. This is God's, you, you know what? I'm sorry. You've got that wrong. It is a changeable law because he created the law. The what? You wonder how much scripture they study. A lot, but once again, you know, the funny thing is, uh, this is what I did that, uh, no, no, next week, next week. Uh, I've typed it a week ago, so I, I'm always forgetting what I'm doing and what I have coming. But next week at the beach is the one on the Sabbath, and there are four prevalent views. You've got what's called the, the um, Seventh-day Sabbath, okay? Then you've got what's called the Puritan Sabbath, then you've got the Lutheran Sabbath, and then you have the fulfilled Sabbath. Those are the four general views of the Sabbath. Which one is right, and how do you know? Well, what I did, I only took the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath and the fulfilled Sabbath and compared the two. If this is correct, then that by default negates the other two, the Puritan Sabbath and the... And what the Puritan and the Lutheran, and I'm going to get this wrong because I didn't really get into it at all, um, but uh, one of them says that you can... Worship all day on Sunday, but you shouldn't be like watching football, you know. So they got these little things that you can or can't do. All right, the full, I'm sorry, the seventh day Sabbath is obvious. It's obvious. It's the Jewish Sabbath, but brought into Christianity. Well, if you can refute that with one of these three, then that must be the correct one. Do you see the logic there? Fulfilled Sabbath. It's the only correct option based on the Bible. It's the only one, and therefore the Puritan and the Lutheran Sabbath are not correct. You don't even need to deal with them. Okay, But if you're dealing with a Puritan or a Lutheran, you can use the same argument that you used against the Seventh-day Adventists. Christ fulfilled the law. He is the end of the law. And this is a part of the law. And once again, unlike the other commandments, which are a part of his nature, this isn't a part of his nature. This is a part of his creation. Mm -hmm. Big difference there, okay? Well, there you go. Oh, think of it this way. This will help you, though. Seeing as how you said, th thought about, this will help you think about it just in a very basic sense. The Israelites, which day of the week did they observe as the Sabbath? Uh, well, what, it was, it was in relation to their... It was Saturday. It was Saturday. In other words, yeah. Sunday is the first day of the week. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Okay. So you have right here... 
they are observing the last day of the week. Sunday is actually oh, yes. right here. Okay? Right. They are observing this. Okay? Christians, I, I don't want to use the term Sabbath because it's fulfilled Sabbath, but Christians worship on Sunday. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're right here. Okay, do you see a difference? They are fulfilling the law. They are working to rest. We are resting to work. Do you see the difference? And they're both pointing in one direction. They're pointing to the cross. They are working to rest. We are resting to work. That's cool. There you go. That should help with that concept. It's, it's not a perfect example, but it does help you to understand the difference between the two. Okay? All right. Seventh day Sabbath. All right. Go ahead. Uh, verse whatever. Okay. Twelve. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Okay. Now, what does that... I know Diane's going to get this. Art, you might get this one too. What is the difference between this commandment and the other ones that we have had so far? Paul explains it in the New Testament. Maybe you know. Paul says it is the first commandment with a, promise. with a promise. There you Good girl. Whoa, I, I just want somebody to, you know, if I say it all, but you'll remember it more if people join in. So it is the first commandment with a promise. God is saying, if you do this, if you do this thing, you will be blessed, right? The, uh, the, your days will be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, why is that such an important commandment then? If it is the first commandment with a promise, why is it so important? It's a picture of us with God, right? He is our Father. We are honoring Him. You know, everything in here points to something greater. Well, in this particular sense, He is saying, I made the family unit. I made the man. I made the woman. That's what I talked about yesterday is, uh, at the beach is, you know, the relationship between men and women and Oh, Linda, I wish I had record. Sergio was gone, you know, so he couldn't tape it. So, oh, I got to do that sermon again. He's gonna, he wants to come to my house and tape it because he's got people in Israel that are watching these. I guess they're Jewish people and he's, you know, so he wants to tape it again. And there's another person out in Texas that has been watching every one of them and he hates God, but I think he's, so it's good that Sergio is doing this. But um, unfortunately, if you ever watch one of them, Linda always laughs at my jokes. She just, you know, and she sits right next to where I am, and so you can hear her laughing. You don't hear anything else, but you hear Linda laughing. And she laughed a couple times last night, and I thought, I'm going to miss that on the video because I have to watch the video because Sergio, he does the editing, and then I watch it for him, make sure it looks good. And uh, anyway, um, I made some jokes about women, and finally I said, ladies, I'm kidding here, but you know, you got to make it fun. Anyway, um, uh, this is a picture. God created man. God created woman. He made them one, and then they were told to have children, right? Okay? This is a picture of God being our Father. We stem from Him. There is a hierarchy. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And there, there are three persons in one essence, but there is a priority. I don't want to say a priority, but there is an order within the Godhead. Okay? So, same thing. And that is why, good girl, I'm so glad that you got that, Jordan. Okay, go ahead. Verse 13. You shall not murder. Okay. Does anybody have anything else in their Bible on that one? Because some older translations say, thou shalt not kill. kill. Difference. It's a big difference because when people stand outside of, uh, of uh, gas chambers and they hold up their stupid little signs, they, you know, kill back then, I'm sure, meant what it means in the newer versions, murder. Uh, I, I mean, when the King James translators translated that. But I want to tell you something, that, that people that say that don't understand the nature of God. They're standing out there saying, you shall not kill when this person has already killed somebody. And God has said that if somebody sheds man's blood, uh, what is it, Genesis 9, 6, by his blood, shall abide, uh, by man's hand shall his blood be shed. There is no atonement for sin except by the blood of the person who committed the crime. And so, once again, we've talked about this several times in this class. Every, and I hate to say this because it makes it sound like I hate these people. I don't. But every abortion doctor in the world is complicit in the murder of every baby that they have killed. Every one of them. And because of that, their life is forfeit. One baby is all it takes 
Now, that is not to say that we are to go blowing up abortion clinics. We're not. That is committing, it's just like killing a baby because of rape or incest. You're just committing another sin. What you want to do is to pray for those people and get them to stop doing what they're doing. And if they repent, if they say, I am sorry for the wicked things I've done, God is going to have the same mercy on them that he had on all of us. And he's going to forgive them of every one of those murders. But if not, then the law says that their life is forfeit. And guess what? Our law allows abortion, and therefore this sin is heaping up in our land. Every baby that is killed, there is no atonement for the land except for the blood of the person who committed the crime. It's representative None. of the nation of Israel. They sacrificed yeah. their children. Molech. That's, exactly what That's they right. And the whole nation suffered. That's exactly there had to be some godly right. People there. Hey, there were godly people. I have yet reserved 7,000. They have not bowed the knee to Baal. But uh, does, have I talked about Molech and how the sacrifice was done in this class? Okay. Molech was a, a, a god of Israel, or not of Israel, a, a pagan god. And what they would do is they had these big brass sculptures of Molech, and they were hollow. Why would they be hollow? Obviously, because you don't want a solid thing anyway, but what's, what, what would they do with these things? They'd have a fire. They'd put a fire inside of it. That's right. They would put a fire inside of the brass until it would be just white hot, and then they'd set their baby on the hands of Molech, sacrifice their children to this, and the so baby would the roast to death. The fire. Yeah. That's right. They would pass their children through the fire. Their children would roast to death as a sacrifice to a God that isn't even a God. So, and, but that, you know what? I hate to tell you, it's no better than what we're doing here. Um, yeah, we're How can it. somebody do these things? But that is what Molech was, was this, this God. They would pass their children through the fire. But it's just a symptom of the degradation of right, the society. Right, of the society. Once you leave God as... You know, as a footstep. Yeah, as your, you know, yeah. as, as your that's exactly right. So, I, you know what? Thou shalt not murder means thou shalt not murder. It doesn't mean you won't kill. Killing is completely different in this context. If somebody murders, you kill them. That's all there is to it. If you don't, then that blood is heaping up in the land. Yes? Got a point note here. The Hebrew word also covers causing human death, even though, even through or negligence. Yes, and that is covered in the book of Leviticus, okay? And that brings in an entirely different picture, okay? I was going to get to that, but I might as well do it. Yeah, we got time. If a person kills a person unintentionally, he's, and he actually gives the example, they're working in the forest and the hex, hex head flies off and kills somebody, it's, it, 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 it's a murder. It's basically, back then they had what was called a goel, which is the avenger of blood. And guess what? In the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called our avenger, right? But goel has another meaning. It, you have to take the context to know how to translate the word goel. The other one is a kinsman redeemer. So in the book of Ruth, the term goel is used as, Jesus, as a kinsman redeemer. Boaz is the nearest relative, okay? Well, Jesus is also called our redeemer, okay? So, and he is our closest relative. When we call on Jesus, we move from Adam to Christ. He becomes our closest relative. Right now, we are closer to Adam than to Jesus. But when we call on him, we move from Adam to Jesus. So I want to kind of get the picture of what's going on there. But the goel, the, the avenger of blood, not the kinsman redeemer, the avenger of blood had a right. Okay, I, let me give an example with you and me. You are working in the woods and you kill somebody unintentionally. Okay? Didn't mean to do it. Axe head flies off and you kill him. That was my brother that died. I have a right, a right under Jewish law to kill you, and nobody can do a thing about it. I have a right. So he set up an entire system within the, the society with what are called um, cities of refuge. And there were cities of refuge interspersed throughout the land of Israel so that if that happened, you could go to a city of refuge. And I couldn't touch you. Once you walked inside of that gate, I could never touch you for the crime you committed. Okay, But once you arrived there, they would have a trial. Was this on purpose or was it by accident? If it was by accident, then you were allowed to live and you had to stay within the city of refuge for your entire life. You could never walk outside the gate. If you did, then your life would be forfeit. One exception, at the death of the high priest. When the high priest died, then 
all the sins were forgiven and you could walk out of that city. So you would hope that the high priest was an old guy and you could go back home soon. The avenger of blood could never touch you after the death of the high priest ever again. Picture of Jesus Christ once again. Everything in this, all of it points to Jesus. Oh man, there goes my hair again. It is so wonderful how God set all of this up, all to point to his son and what he did, our great high priest. But just so you know, if you killed my brother, I would have every right in the Jewish society, whether it was intentional or unintentional, to take your life. Okay, unless you made it to the city of refuge first. And if you did, then I couldn't touch you unless you were found guilty. Then they would kick you out and then me and the rest of the family would kill you, right? But if not, then you would be allowed to stay in that city forever until the death of the high priest. Then you could come out. If I killed you, then it is now a act of intentional murder and now my life is forfeit by your family. So, oh boy, you can see how complicated it got. Yeah, you really... That's right. That's right. So, you know, you, it, but that was to protect the people. It was also to point us to Jesus. All of this does. Anyway, so murder in that instance is the intentional or in that case in the Hebrew society, the unintentional act of killing somebody based on the kinsman redeemer, the avenger of blood uh, uh, thing that was set up by God. Okay, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Okay, hardest one in the world for any normal person to not violate. Why? Because Jesus said intent is sin. And you know what? I, 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 I don't know about anybody else, but intent goes through my mind about 8 million times a day, not even intending to. It's just, you know, I, I, it's just, the it, it's, it, it's a condition of the heart. And I tell you what, if I have to say I'm sorry, Lord, 4,000 times a day, I do it 4,000 times a day because I just... Nothing intentional. It just, you know, I, I'm not even going to get into it. You but know, when we're talking about adultery, he uses this example a lot about how the nation of Israel were spiritual even, adultery. Even That's in right. Revelation, it talks about the mother of whores. That's mother of harlots. That's right. Which is all this one in particular is has as much symbolic value as it does actual value because of what she said. Adultery in the Bible. All of the prophets. Talk of having any God before the true God as adultery, spiritual adultery. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take you to one of the, the most, if I can find it I, had it, I found it first thing yesterday, and I may not be able to find it at all today, but it is one of the most graphic, uh, here it is. Is this it? Ah, here it is. Let me find it. Um, uh, Talking about the adultery of the nation of Israel, slain my children. Talking about the last one, ca causing them to pass through the fire. This is a chapter 16 of Ezekiel. You know, I'm not going to read it because it is so graphic you may not want to hear it. If you want to read this and understand how God looks at the sin of spiritual adultery, read chapter 16 of Ezekiel. And it is, it is so... It is, it, it is so um, uh, graphic... You know what, it, I, I would never read it in front of a child, but chapter 16 of Ezekiel, and he goes through the entire process. He, he equates him with Sodom. The terminology he uses is, it is simply unbelievable. That's the chapter you want to read, but I'm not going to read it, okay? Chapter 16. Yeah. Okay, very, very graphic stuff in there. But that is how the Lord views these things, and he's using our physical nature in a spiritual sense, Okay. Yeah, no, we, we won't read that today. Just if you want to understand how seriously God takes that, there's no point in me reading it because, you know, you can, you can read it. You said this all relates to God and our relationship with, with him. him. And, and that's how, you know, the more I see, and you mentioned this before, that God really just chose Israel and he just kind of grabbed yes. a group of people through which he was going to show his standards. And um, that's really not been a blessing. No, you know, but you know what he says? He says in Deuteronomy 26 and 28, the blessings and the curses. And you're right. The blessings turn into curses. Because if we're you, not able. We're not able. And boy, you know what? It, it, the, the lesson for us is that, it, but it's the same thing with America today. So I can't say poor Israel, but at the same time, we have to say how merciful God is on us as individuals. Forget the nation. Because what Israel got is what we deserve. That is all there is to it. What Israel got is what we deserve. But boy, instead he gave us grace. Wow. Okay. While we're on verse number 14, has anybody here ever heard of the wicked 
Bible. Mm. The, Wiccan? the Wicked Bible. It, I just have to tell you this because... Wicked, not Wiccan. Wicked. W-I-C-K-E-D. I have to tell you, just simply because this is a part of history, it is one of the most expensive Bibles in the world. There's only a couple copies of it. And it's because of one word. One word. I think it was a King James Version of the Bible, but one word is missing in the entire Bible. When the printers printed it, they left out a word by accident. It says, thou shalt commit adultery. Oh, wow. they, they just left off not. And they were fined, I think it was 6,000 pieces of silver back then. It was enough, I'm sure it bankrupted them. But they were fined by the British government because of it. And the Bible is an absolute collector's item. But they, they just simply printed it wrong. And, you know, maybe the guy, that the, the typesetter did it intentionally. Maybe he had a Freudian slip. I don't know what. But that is one of the most expensive Bibles. And if you want to see a copy of it, go online. Just type in the Wicked Bible images, you know, your image search on the Internet. And they have it printed there. And you can see, thou shalt commit adultery. And every time I read, you know, think about this verse, the Wicked Bible comes to mind. Because there was a guy in, I think it's in New Mexico or Arizona or one of these states. He sells old Bibles. He's got original copies of the 16. 10 King James Version. He's got original copies. He's got pages of the Gutenberg Bible, which are, you know, he's got, uh, he sells individual pages of the 1611 King James Version, probably got damaged, and so he sells pages of it, and they're like a hundred and some dollars each. They're not as much as you'd think, but if you pick a particular page, like say the, 30, the, the 23rd Psalm, that's going to be thousands of dollars, okay? So it is based on if you just get an arbitrary page or if you get a whole page. But just to have a page of the original 1610 King James Version would be kind of cool. I had a, uh, one of the uh, uh, doctors up at the uh, seminary had one on display there that he had bought. And I've always thought if I had the money and it's something, I, but you know, there's other things to do with your money. But it's just kind of neat to think that you can have a copy of this original published Bible. But the Wicked Bible itself is a very, very rare Bible. And that's where that comes from. Just in case you ever heard, hear the term Wicked Bible. Okay, so uh, are you reading now? Verse uh, 15? You shall not steal. Okay. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Okay. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Okay, now, I, I'm not going to say, I was going to say what the old King James Version says there, but read it yourself, and anyway. Um, uh, okay, if you break these up, people try to divide these like into the first five pertain to um, uh, God, this... The second five pertain to, now I, I can't remember, there are different ways of breaking these 10 up so that they, you can arrange them, just like the book of Revelation, you can arrange it 50 different ways. People try to find divisions in here, and what I explained before you came in is that when you covet, you violate the first commandment. There's really no way of breaking these up where you say this pertains to this and this pertains right. to this. They all do. Now, what you didn't hear, and I want you to hear this because you're in the class, is uh, uh, Jordan, will you explain to her the difference between the Catholic and the, uh, the uh, Protestant Ten Commandments? Or unless you already know. No, but we had a big fight with our Catholic friend in New Mexico. Because, because go ahead and explain to her what we talked about. They take out the second commandment, which is um, have no other gods before, before me. me. And then to make up the deficiency of deleting a commandment, they separate the 10th commandment into thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. And then, so that's the ninth commandment. And then the 10th commandment is thou shalt not cover, covet your neighbor's belongings or his servants. You got that? And, and what they will do sometimes in her... So did they do that intentionally? Oh yes, and we talked about that. There are different types of idolatry to them. Uh, they have what's called Idolatria and idolatria, those two types of idolatry. One of them is acceptable, one of them isn't, is what they say. And so they pray to statues. They are servicing that statue. They're not actually worshiping and they pray, it. And they pray to saints and they pray to... That's the, right. The all, all of that is idolatry. All of it. But they call one latria and one dulia. And I, I think dulia is to be a slave to from the word doulos uh, in Greek. And I may be wrong... But anyway, they make a distinction when there is no distinction in the Bible. There is worshiping God 
and there is other, and that's all there is to it. But that is how they get around that, is by taking the second commandment and either entirely incorporating it in the first commandment or just deleting it as they did in her copy and saying the second commandment or, or whatever, these other words are incorporated into there. So I wanted you to know the distinction between the two. Other people, you know, if they watch the video, great. If they don't, then they're going to have to wait and we'll do this again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But there is, to some people, a distinction when there is no distinction to God. And that's what I said in my sermon. It's either the Bible or the church, either the Bible or the church, and you have to decide, and God already has. Well, you know, while we're on the subject of the Ten Commandments, being fulfilled in Christ and all that, yeah. but our nation that was a Christian nation, of course we now call it Judeo-Christian, Sure. but, I mean, you got the Ten Commandments that were posted everywhere. So everywhere. The Supreme Court and all that. And, yeah, some of them are still there. And, of course, yeah. I can see at the Supreme Court, because it's part of our <coughs> establishment of our laws as far as do not murder, do not, not all of them, but not adultery and all that. Although that is against the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Oh, yes. And, and you can be pr prosecuted for adultery in, in the military. But um, it just seems to me like it's kind of mixing the law with grace. Oh, yeah. well, you know, I agree with that. And I've thought about that. And uh, first I'll address the Judeo-Christian thing, which is, that's a misnomer. I'm sorry. This is a Christian nation. The fact... Now, Jewish people, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have a nation because they helped fund the right. Revolutionary War. But their values were not what was being expounded by the Christians. They were, when they say Judeo-Christian, they're saying the Judeo-Scriptures in the New Testament. They're trying to mix the two to be more accommodating. When, in fact, as I, I don't remember where I said this. I might have said it in a sermon or I might have said it in the class. But um, uh, biblical... Judaism leads naturally to Christianity. Rabbinic Judaism, which is what people nowadays are trying to equate as the same thing, has nothing to do with biblical Judaism. It's based on what's called the Gemara and the Mishnah, okay? Which are, are the, uh, and together they make what is called the Talmud. I don't know if you've heard of the Talmud, but that is the codification of Jewish law. Okay, one of them is a commentary, the Gemara and the Mishnah, I'll have to look this up. One of them is a commentary on the Torah, and then the other one is all of the, the, the laws that are added in and everything, and it becomes the Talmud. The Babylonian... It's like the, church, the Book of Discipline with the Methodist. Oh, yeah, but let me tell you what, it is 17 large volumes long. It is this, that's the Babylonian Talmud, and then the, the Palestinian Talmud is a little shorter, I believe. But it's a very large body of law that they use, okay? As a matter of fact, it's so convoluted, I don't think anybody could ever perform it anyway. It's, it be, it's the establishment of their way of life. There's a big difference between rabbinic Judaism and what I call biblical Judaism. Because if you're a biblical Jew, you're going to be a Christian. The, you, you don't end at Malachi where it says, if you don't do these things, I'm going to come and smite the land with a curse. You don't end the Bible on a curse. You end the Bible on a blessing, which happens in Revelation. Everything in the Old Testament is saying something is coming. And it suddenly ends. And nothing came. That is not correct. It is obvious that something more was coming, and that is Jesus Christ. And so the biblical Judaism will always lead to Christianity. Anyway, um, the, the Ten Commandments, you're right. The Founding Fathers... Uh, you know, they held it in high esteem, but I have a feeling, this is just me, because you know, I, I believe the law is set, no, I don't have to say I believe the law is set inside in Christ, the law is set inside in Christ, because that's what the Bible teaches. But you need to remember that the people that established and founded this nation were coming out of Reformed theology. And because of that, they were still not fully versed on what it says, for example, in the book of Hebrews. They're more holding on to the Reformed theology, where they're, they're mixing in in other words, covenant theology. They, they're not dispensationalists back then. And because of that, they didn't understand that the Jewish people really have a purpose in the world. They didn't understand that what Jesus was saying in the four Gospels has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with the kingdom age. Until the night that he said the new covenant in my blood, there was no new covenant. So people were mixing this into what's called con covenant theology instead of dispensationalism. So I understand why we have the Ten Commandments and people were, you know, observing Seventh-day Sabbaths and all these things because they had not developed their theology to the point. And why? Because God 
It, Jim Dwyer said it the best of anybody I've ever heard. Of, he said it yesterday. Uh, how did, let me get this right because I'm going to misquote what he said. But he said, why would dispensationalism, if, I think everybody here agrees in dispensationalism, that, that the Jews have a purpose, then the church age, and then we're going to have the, the tribulation period, which is part of belonging to the Jews, right? And that's what we believe in this church because that's what the Bible teaches. But it was hidden. It was a mystery. And Jim said, why would God reveal the very thing that he's trying to conceal? If the Jews have a purpose and they are being punished because of disobedience, but they still have a purpose, why would God reveal that to the church? See what I'm saying? It makes no sense until it's time for it to be revealed. And all of a sudden, just before the Jews go back into the land, people start saying, wait a minute, the Jews, we've been wrong about this. And they start reading their Bible in a different light. Of course they are, because the Holy Spirit is now bringing it out. He's saying, something is coming. The fulfillment of the ages is coming. Of course it makes sense. But the way he said it was so common, matter of fact, that I wish I could remember it. But, and Paul always talks about it as a mystery. It's a, mystery. a mystery. It's a mystery. And just because it says it's a mystery doesn't mean that we understand it now. There's more that we don't understand. Of course that's the case. So anyway, it, it, that is why I believe the, the nation was founded on Christianity, Christian principles. But once again, it was still in the... The what do you call it? The the said yes, the reform theology. But there's a, a term when you're talking about infancy. It was oh. still in its infancy of dispensationalism. Those ideas really didn't come about until the 1800s. But the commandments also help the, the government side. Absolutely. Uh, laws and all of that. That's right. Because you know what? Once again, nine of the ten commandments are repeated in the New Testament. So of course we should have them all over the place because they. Don't kill, don't, you know, don't commit adultery, don't do these things. But the Sabbath, when you have the Ten Commandments on display, all of a sudden you have to think, well, these nine apply and this one doesn't. Why? Right. See, it does cause a bit of confusion. But I have no problem with the Ten Commandments being displayed anywhere because they are, they are God's nature. And yes, we are observing the Sabbath. You are observing the Sabbath right now. Art is too. He's sitting back there observing the Sabbath, aren't you, Art? We are in God's rest right now. So... In essence, we are still fulfilling the Ten Commandments. 